Thank you very much. So yes, um, I'm going to talk about Hashgraph and Hedera. Hashgraph is the technology, the consensus protocol, and Hedera is a, is a relatively new um, initiative of ours to create a public ledger based on Hashgraph to, uh, to compete with the other uh, platforms out there. So forgive me if I spend a little bit of time just on, on background because it's kind of fundamental to what Hashgraph focuses on and I think distinguishes us. Um, so this is what consensus is trying to do. Community of people, we don't really trust each other. Sometimes they trust each other more than others, but you have to assume they don't trust each other and that some will um, maliciously act. But nevertheless, come to agreement on the order that a given set of transactions happen. Once you agree upon the order of a given set of transactions, then you can ask other questions. Then you can validate them, see if there's double spends, etc. But ordering and timing is fundamental. Uh, historically, that was easy. You just threw in a trusted third party. And they mediated the trust, and they sat in the middle of all the transactions, and they were the ones, the arbiters of timing and order. They decreed um, when things happened. Um, so we want to do that without, right? We want to come to consensus on when things happen and do so in, in the uh, presence of faults. Um, both network faults, the fact that some messages may not get through, either just by network delay or, or potentially malicious actors trying to prevent those. And some messages might get through, but they might have been corrupted intentionally so by malicious actors. So if we can come to consensus on the ordering and timing of transactions, even in the presence of these sorts of faults, then we're doing well. So I make the analogy that consensus models, um, as an analogy, can be differentiated uh, similar to how democracies can be differentiated. If you think about democratic systems in the world, most are representative democracies, where citizens, like you and I, uh, elect politicians, and we empower them with the, the special ability and permissions to make the laws. And the social contract is such that we all agree to abide by the laws made by the politicians that we've empowered. So we can constrain that power, we can have term limits in order to, uh, to ensure that they refresh, but, but the nature of the agreement is that they're in charge and they, that they will decree what laws are. Um, and in consensus, they'll decree what the latest block is, or consensus. Contrast that with a direct democratic model. Um, I think Switzerland may be the only uh, nation that does this with any sort of regularity, California and the states, where rather than electing leaders, citizens are asked to vote directly on the laws that will then govern society. So a much more granular uh, mechanism of uh, democracy. Um, so in both democracies and consensus, things can go wrong. So leaders can be compromised, um, leaders can be bribed, leaders can be corrupted, all the things that um, that can go wrong with a human system and with humans can happen to leader-based consensus. If you've elected a given leader, however you've done so, whatever the criteria for that election, whether it's proof of work, stake, or any of the other proofs, um, you know, the leader, this leader has stopped working. <laughs> so, um, so all the things that can go wrong with a leader can happen to a leader-based consensus model. On the other hand, um, democratic models for democracy have not scaled well. Referenda, plebiscites, etc. they have this intuitive attractiveness that individuals like you and I would directly determine what the laws will be. But we don't want to spend our lives voting on the laws that will govern us. So we, we're willing to engage in that, that contract where we vote in politicians. Um, so that's my, 
that's, that's my segue into Hashgraph. Because Hashgraph is a consensus model that we believe um, leverages the direct democratic model of democracy in that there are no leaders. We don't elect them via proof of work or anything. And this is a, a blockchain conspiracy. Um, you cannot keep me silent. So, so the premise is, is that we can have the, the advantages of the democratic system of democracy as applied to consensus, but without the inefficiencies that historical uh, protocols have had. Yes. Yes. Um, so, in, in a DAG, um, rather than all transactions sort of being forced uh, into a linear chain, DAGs are more flexible. Blocks or transactions are allowed to uh, flow more freely, uh, and it's only subsequently that we worry about trying to extract consensus from them. Um, so we often get compared to the other DAGs, notably, or at least historically notably, Tangle, uh, IOTA's Tangle, and that's fine. But, but I would argue that more notable than the fact that we are DAGs, and I think DAG chain is, is actually more of a continuum than a binary because there's, there's middle ground along there. Um, more interesting and notable than whether a ledger is DAG-based or otherwise is what does the DAG represent? If you think about the DAG, that tangled diagram that IOTA has popularized to their credit, there's vertices and there's edges. What do the edges represent? In Tangle, those vertices represent, to some extent, uh, an endorsement or a validation. Like when a node wants to add new transactions, they do a tiny bit of proof of work, in a sense, confirming two older transactions. So those edges in the DAG, in their DAG, represent that that work. Ours represents something very different. And it's because they're different that I'll explain that, that the consensus we get is different as well. So this, just to, to reiterate the point, in a chain, everybody's energy goes into pruning off the things that aren't part of the main chain. Proof of work is designed to slow things down so that you can do that, so that it's viable to throw off orphan blocks that would otherwise cause rampant forking and blow things up. The end result is clean, because the end result, you put all this energy into throwing off the things that you didn't want, you end up with a nice, clean, temporal order. The price, of course, is that you spend a lot of energy in assembling that linear chain, and you slow things down, at least in proof of work systems, so that you could do so. As I said, in a DAG, you're not so uptight in the first part. You let transactions happen, you record them, but you don't initially try to shove them into that, that temporal order. You're more flexible. And it's only subsequently, once everybody has the same picture, the DAG, uh, that you analyze that DAG and extract consensus from it. So a hash graph is a DAG, and the edges in our DAG represent messages. We actually represent a history of the messages that flowed amongst the participants. And to cut to the end, it's because all nodes are able to build a consistent picture of the history of all the messages that flowed amongst the nodes. They're able to extract temporal information from that data structure and do so consistently so that they all get the same answers. And that's what we set out to do. We set out to define an order that everybody can agree on for a set of transactions. And that's what we'll enable. Um, we start with a messaging model that is by no means unique to, to us. We just leverage it with a, a slight variation. Um, when a transaction happens, <laughs> <laughs> is there a minor in here? 
all the stuff. This is not a blockchain conspiracy. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. No. Uh, no. Uh, Let me see. Coming up. There we go. There we go. Nope. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll just yell. Exactly. Uh, so, gossip. Bitcoin gossips, right? Bitcoin gossips transactions and they gossip about the blocks that are subsequently mined. We gossip as well. Transaction happens, you want the community to know about it, you tell somebody. And then they randomly tell somebody else. And then they randomly tell somebody else. So, very quickly, exponentially fast, Everybody at least knows that something happened. That something might be uh, a currency spend. It might be a smart contract being deployed. It might be a file being stored. At this point, everybody knows it happened. They've all got the, the transaction. But we don't yet know, or we haven't yet agreed on when it happened. Because inevitably, this thing reached the community at different times, just because we gossip to different people in, in different orders. So everybody in this room, as an example, would have heard about that transaction at a different time. We don't yet have consensus, but we've got data that we can mine. The fact that everybody has heard about it, if we could add a small bit of information so that not only have you heard about it, but you know when others have heard about it and have do so in a consistent manner, then all of you in the room can analyze your messaging, your history, and ask yourself questions, we'll get to that consensus order. So, to reiterate, everybody knows about it, good start, but it's not enough. So how do we add a little bit of extra information to those messages, those fundamental messages where I sent five coins to somebody else, we add a tiny bit of metadata to that message I don't believe it. <laughs> um, so not only do I say that Bob uh, sent Alice five coins, I tell that recipient who I learned that from. So I tell the recipient indirectly the fact that Charlie told me that Bob sent Alice five coins. Every time nodes talk about transactions, they add that additional gossip from the previous hop. So every time nodes talk, they share information about the messaging history of that, double, of that coin spend. So critically, nodes not only learn about the transactions happening, the coin spend, they also learn what others knew about that transaction, and critically, the times they learned about them. So this is our DAG. The, the vertices represent events kind of comparable to a block set of transactions with the hash, critically two hashes, making us a DAG and not a chain. So when I create an event comparable to a block, I put in transactions I want to talk about, but I also add two hashes, one of which is the last event I created, likely microseconds before, and the other one is a hash of the last event that somebody else sent me which inevitably contain transactions. Every time nodes talk, they do so through this mechanism. The end result is that the recipient of this event, not only do they learn about the transactions within it, but they, they can infer what I knew about other transactions, because there's hashes in there, so they can recreate that structure. We're getting close. We still don't yet have a consensus timestamp for those events, those transactions, nor do we have an order, but we can now make a definition. We can define the consensus timestamp for a given block of transactions and event as the median of the time that the members of the community received it. Flows out to everybody in the room. Everybody's able to infer what everybody else knows about that. They're able to calculate the median of a list of some representative members of this room. They all calculate the same median. They calculated the consensus timestamp. They move on. So I said community. Which members of the community? Couldn't be everybody, because if somebody left the room, we're shut down. We couldn't rely on everybody. So to determine which members of the room get to logically contribute a time to that list from which we take the median, 
we vote on it. Everybody looks at their hash graph, that data structure, the messaging history, and they effectively vote on who were the active members of the community, who in this room was gossiping. And there's criteria by which participation is measured. The active members of the, the community, those in the room and talking, are allowed to contribute a timestamp. And that's it. Because once everybody agrees on who gets to contribute a time, everybody will agree on the median, and everybody will agree on the consensus timestamp. And that's what we set out to do. Um, so are we fast? So the algorithm itself, that's, that's it. It has some advantages. Um, so unfortunately, the numbers are small. These are uh, performance curves we published recently, somewhat out of date now. So a couple of things. Um, it shows the relationship between TPS on the bottom, ranging up to 500K, and latency on the left, how long it takes us to get to consensus for a given transaction. Um, topping out at about 11 seconds for 128 nodes, in this case, two regions. So 128 nodes distributed across the US. So we had some, some nodes on the East Coast, some nodes on the West Coast. Um, so at the high end, in that sort of geographic distribution, we can hit 500K. There's a trade-off. We get higher latency. Um, we can tune that. If latency is critical, you can dial things down so you run at a slower speed. If latency isn't critical, you turn things up, so you maximize your throughput. Um, not shown is that for a single region, our numbers are much better. Because every, if everything's geo, uh, closely geolocated, then latency, messaging latency is that much smaller. For a global distribution, our numbers are not as good. Our curves are, are um, slower and lower TPS. Um, so a caveat is that these numbers are just for consensus. So these were dummy transactions. In any real deployment, it's not enough to know when something happened. You also have to know, is it good? Who sent it? You know, validate a signature. And then also reflect it. If it's a, if it's a coin, if it's a spend, you want to raise the value in one account balance and drop it in the other. So a full consensus transaction reflects those three pieces. Consensus, typically a digital signature verification, and then some input output. We, um, on the second part, the digital signature verifications, we partnered with, with one of the uh, two largest GPU manufacturers. They were able to um, demonstrate signature verifications of, I think it was 1.2 million transactions per second. So with a GPU, signature verification is not going to be the bottleneck. Nor do we think uh, input-output, just, just uh, uh, touching the database, is going to be a bottleneck either. I think consensus historically has been the bottleneck. And, and hopefully these, uh, these speeds mean that it won't be a bottleneck in practice. We're, we're fast because we're, effic we're efficient. So there's no proof of work. So as far as processing, we don't artificially slow things down. We run as fast as the bandwidth allows us. And with respect to bandwidth, we're efficient because we don't have any virtual, we don't have any votes flowing across the network. That voting algorithm I described is virtual. Everybody ran it independently. You didn't talk about it. You didn't share your votes. You just came to the same conclusion and moved on. So another aspect is, is what we call fairness. Um, I would contend that, that in this sense, any leader-based system, blockchain or otherwise, where a given node uh, contributing to consensus is empowered with the ability or the permission to decree what consensus is, whether you've selected them based on work or stake or some other criteria, it can't be fair in the sense of guaranteeing um, censorship against a given party. So in, in, in Bitcoin, the miner that wins the puzzle can select which transactions to add, and they'll do so based on fees. 
They can add them in different orders or they can uh, disregard them totally. That's not fair. And it, and it reflects on the, the analogy I made about uh, democracies. Um, a leader, once we elect them, doesn't have to be fair. We can't guarantee that through the system. So security is a big bucket. Uh, one aspect of which is that the nature of the algorithm, because we have no leader, means there's no inherent vulnerability to a denial of service, distributed or otherwise. There is no one special node that determines what consensus will be. If one node goes down, the others proceed uh, without them. Uh, modulo, a certain number not going down. Two thirds have to be alive um, to, uh, to keep things going. So another aspect of, of security is the nature of the consensus that we can deliver. So asynchronous BFT means, uh, in this context, means that the consensus you come to is not a probabilistic sort of confidence that you're getting close, that we're feeling pretty good about this transaction, soon we'll be able to trust it. In an ABFT system, like Hashgraph, when you come to consensus, you know it. And you know others have come to the same consensus, and you move on. So it's, it's that step function of confidence as opposed to that red curve of probabilistic, not, not drawn to scale, clearly, right? The, the, the red curve is, is steeper. But there's always a calculation you need to make in the chain where certainty comes with more blocks being added on to the end. And that varies how many blocks, how long it takes, but there's always this calculation you need to make about how certain am I at this point. So with those properties, speed, uh, security, and fairness, we think we can address both new use cases that to date haven't been practical or viable, and, and address the other use cases that uh, current ledgers are, are running up against scale limitations, as an example. Um, the fairness is critical for any sort of use case where there's a matching between parties, a market, an auction, eBay, similar. If you have to uh, match a bid against uh, another quote, you have to be able to guarantee the participants that there's nobody skewing and arranging, rearranging that order inappropriately. Our algorithm can provide that. Um, the fact that we're efficient will mean that we anticipate having very low fees on a public ledger. And thereby, we think we'll make micropayments more viable. You can't have micropayments if the fees are significantly comparable to the value of the transactions you're trying to enable. So that was Hashgraph. Hashgraph is just a consensus uh, algorithm. Historically, we, we started Hashgraph um, in the permission world, selling into enterprises, credit unions, supply chains, etc. Hedera is our initiative to uh, take the algorithm and deploy it as a public country. So um, I'll talk about the additional pieces, both architectural and governance, that we think are necessary for a public ledger. So what are the requirements for a public ledger? I've touched on performance, security, um, governance and stability. Uh, not so critical in a, in a permissioned world where everybody knows the nodes, and it's far easier to impose policies and rules uh, in a permission world. But that's not the case in a, in a public ledger. So I'll, I'll focus on, on how we think our model for governance and our model for licensing will enable uh, the necessary level of stability. So, so this is Solomon, a uh, biblical analogy. Um, you know, the, the current governance model on, on the public change is, is forking by default, when in doubt, fork, right? And that's, that's the means by which the community is allowed to, um, to some extent, uh, indicate their disapproval of, of the current governance model, right? The end result is, you know, multiple coins, uh, arguably um, splits in the, in the network effect that otherwise would have been possible. So the Hedera governance model rejects that. And we, we do so in two notable ways. Uh, one of which is that the governance model, the decisions by which the ledger will evolve over time, is entrusted to 39 
members of a council. These are large Fortune 100 companies, um, known brands, known reputations. The premise is that those 39, with their expertise and their, their uh, existing um, uh, determination to protect their brand and reputation, will do a good job of governing, will make governance decisions that benefit not just themselves, but, but critically also themselves, but the ledger as a whole. So it's by design, it'll be a mix of verticals, a mix of uh, geographic distribution, will inhibit the, the risk of some nation state shutting or having undue influence over the ledger through by their influence over members of the council. It'll be those 39 that make the decisions about how the ledger will evolve, setting fees as an example, um, determining when software updates happen, et cetera. Um, also critically, or notably different, is the fact that there is a patent, or there's patents, multiple patents on the algorithm. Um, and that will be used indirectly as a defensive mechanism to, at the end of the day, uh, as much as possible, inhibit forks. We see forks um, ultimately in the public chains as being a negative influence, and we want to control that. We want to stop that. We want to prevent, as much as we can, uh, a diet Hedera or some other Hedera cache, whatever variant somebody calls it, right? We're not naive. The code will be available. Code will be open review. Anybody can audit it. We'll have it professionally audited as well. Anybody can copy it and compile it. Um, the hope is that the patent and the risk of legal repercussions will discourage the credible companies from making that decision. And the hope is that the network effect of the 39 will um, inhibit the chance of anybody having any, any success with that sort of fork. Um, critically, although the code itself will not be fully open source, anybody can build whatever they want on top of a ledger. So there's no license required, you don't need to come talk to us. It's publicly available. Build what you want, build open source, build proprietary, that's your call. There'll be no uh, implications of our licensing below. So, a little bit about the architecture. Um, so I talked about the algorithm, voting algorithm. In a public ledger, we have to guard against civil attacks where anybody can spin up a node and thereby take control of the network. We inhibit that by a very simple state model where the votes that a given node has towards consensus are weighted by how many coins they have. So similar to Casper, EOS, Cardano, et cetera, but notably, there's no, there's no punitive aspect, there's no slashing, there's no bonding. Co coins once staked can be used at any time, you don't tying them up. Um, also noteworthy, and this, this has analogies in, in some of the uh, 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 DPoS models like EOS. If I have coins, but I don't have a node, for whatever reason I don't want to run a node, we, First of all, we want you to run a node, but if you choose not to, that's fine. You can proxy your stake to a node, effectively then lend them your stake, and thereby use your stake towards consensus, but indirectly. And critically, you both get rewards. Nodes are compensated based on their participation towards consensus. They're using the, the costs they uh, bear for bandwidth, processing, storage, etc. Uh, but also will be those who proxy state to them. They'll be rewarded too. Uh, it's a fee model. So the assumption is, is that the users of the network, the clients sending transactions to nodes for submission into the ledger, will pay fees. And those fees, uh, three, different fee three different types of fees, but the premise is that um, you pay the nodes for their work towards consensus, Certain nodes bear different costs towards that than others, and we acknowledge that. And critically, we acknowledge that there's work to be done beyond just contributing to the consensus. So if it's a smart contract or a file storage, nodes bear long-term costs, and we want to compensate nodes for those as well. 
Um, sharding, uh, like others, we recognize that true large scale, millions of TPS, we showed, I showed high TPS for a single shard, but if we want to reach millions of uh, transactions per second, um, the model where every node learns about every transaction won't scale. So we'll shard when we need to. We'll divide our nodes up into smaller sets. Nodes within a set only deal with transactions within that set. And when necessary, sh shards will communicate uh, inter-shard to ensure that uh, across all shards we can maintain consensus. Um, we, we're, we touched on KYC and we'll touch more when we have a panel later. Um, we recognize or we're assuming that regulatory bodies are going to be expecting and or mandating more transparency for transactions on a public ledger. In anticipation of that, we've designed uh, an opt-in identity mechanism whereby the sorts of assertions that were being described, Dutch citizenship, etc., can be bound to an account balance or an account on the ledger. Uh, it's, it's an opt-in model so that users explicitly have to uh, endorse this mechanism. The, uh, the Dutch government that attested to your citizenship, they can opt out as well. So should, should it be the case that you lose your citizenship, that binding can be revoked. Um, and we think the privacy mechanism, or the privacy aspect, uh, whereby a user can opt out is useful as well. Um, so out of the door, we'll, we'll support Solidity scripts. Um, ERC20 and others. So if someone's developing on Ethereum now, uh, we're confident that that script will run on Hedera when we go live. And that's it. Oh, thanks. So I, I, I was given five minutes, so I think we might have time for questions. Question about the patent? So, so the question is, if, if, if Bitcoin is at one extreme of high cost and high immutability, um, and the other end is low cost, low immutability by inference, where would we be on the, uh, the, the range? Um, so the hash graph itself that, that we constructed collaboratively and independently, that has similar crypto security characteristics as a Bitcoin. It doesn't have proof of work associated with it, but the digital signatures and, and hashes have a similar resistance to modification. The state that nodes collaboratively maintain, the consensus state, the, the balances of wallets as an example, or file storage, um, the resistance to mutability, or the resistance to, yeah, the resistance to mutability uh, is a social construct in that case. If I have a thousand nodes, I can change my state, but I can't convince anybody else that it's real. And anybody else joining the network wouldn't trust my representation of state until they saw um, a representation of state that was signed by more than two-thirds of the nodes. So we have a similar uh, resistance to unauthorized changes to the database. Um, critically, hard and fast immutability, I think, is becoming more and more of an issue. GDPR, we'll touch on that in the panel. Uh, GDPR, copyright, illegal, uh, and questionable material on the ledger. There are, there are use cases where it's appropriate and perhaps required to be able to get that material off the ledger. 
but do so in a manner that's consistent with the consensus of the community as a whole. And we have a model where we can uh, address that as well. Thank you.